All right, in this lesson, we are going to walk you through a Form 1040. This is the tax return form that every taxpayer has to file on their income. So we're gonna walk you through, we're not gonna necessarily talk about all the specific details when we get to certain lines, I will go through the details, um, but this is to give you an overview so that when you start to see this more and more often, you kind of know what you're up against when it comes to these tax forms. So we're gonna talk about these tax forms, help you understand it, give you a little bit of familiarity to it so that once you start seeing it, you're like, I know what these lines mean. And really, they're not that complicated at the end of the day. And I promise you, by the end of this video, you have a better understanding on how a tax return looks like. Now, we're looking at the basic 1040, and let's go ahead and start walking you through. So, a couple of things that you should know is that starting with the 2018 tax year, and this is for filing year 2019. So, we go through the year, so 2018 we go through the year, and then we don't file those taxes until 2019. So starting with the 2018 tax year, 2019 filing season, a new consolidated tax form was created to make the process of filing taxes simpler for the majority of tax payers. And we talked a little bit about this in one of our first videos. Prior to 2018, there were three basic tax forms, 1040EZ, 1040A, and then 1040 long form. Now we've gotten rid of all three of them and all we have is just the 1040, that's the basic. And that basic return is basically kind of like a puzzle piece, right? So we've got the 1040 here and then we start tacking on additional schedules to it as we need them based on our individual situation. So kind of the 1040 is the basis here of everything and then we start tacking on other schedules when we have more complicated things that we need to report on. So here is a look of the basic 1040. This is a half sheet piece of paper basically. We've got the page one here and then we have page two. So if it's a half sheet paper, we've got the front of the half sheet and then we can turn it around and we get page two which is the back half. If you notice, it's this peachy greenish uh, aquamarine type color. That's kind of uh, what that color is if you actually print it out. Most of us now electronically file, so we don't really get to see what this actually looks like in real life. So let's take a look at the front end of this. So we wanna point out here that uh, the first thing that we have see on this return is the filing status, that's right here. Here, the filing status it helps us tells us uh, helps us determine how our taxes are affected by uh, this status. So, filing status affects how your taxes will be calculated at the end of the day. So, you'll have a couple options: single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, head of household, and qualified widow. Those are your options. There, a lot of it is pretty straightforward. If you're single, you're not married. You're going to choose single. If you are married. You can choose between married and married, married filing jointly, married filing singly, or if you are single and maybe have another dependent, you can have head of household, or if your spouse dies and you're filing married filing jointly in the prior year, then you have qualifying widower. So that's an important aspect. It's just basically checking the box here. Um, and we're gonna discuss more of that in the second chapter. The other thing that we have here is we've got personal identifiable information here. So this big part right here is all personal identifiable information. So we got your name first and last, social security number, and then um, spouse, same thing with the spouse. So we've got spouse's first and last name, their social security number. It asks you a question about standard deduction. And then we've got um, is uh, your address here. And then we've got dependent information here as well. Again, you'll get more practice as we start doing more problems with this return. Um, but basically simple things that you just need to plug in those information there. So no calculations or nothing very specific with the tax law there. Now, before we turn it to the back page, we want to also address here that we have a signature side and a paid preparer. So signature, we always ask your clients to sign this before mailing it into the IRS if they are doing this by paper. If it's done by electronic, 
typically we have them sign an electronic um, e-filing paper that's kind of similar to this that attests to the same thing. Uh, occupation, you as a tax preparer can put the occupation for your client, uh, but they do need to sign, you can't sign for them. And then a PIN number, a PIN number, you can put any PIN number, that's if the IRS does wanna talk to you, they can use that PIN number and easily to identify the right person. And then paid preparer, that's you as the tax preparer, that's what you would put in that box. You would sign your name and then you would put information there. Uh, we will talk about this in another chapter, but if you don't do that, there is a pay preparer penalty for not signing your return. And that is something that happens a lot with uh, tax preparers that aren't registered with the IRS or aren't CPAs or lawyers. They're, they don't want to sign on the return, but they want to get paid for it. So then they won't sign it. They'll say self-prepared, something like that. So important to understand there. All right. So now turning it to the back of the page, we start with line one. So line one is your wages, salaries, and tips. This is typically on your W-2. So if you are an employee, you'll receive a W-2. That's what goes into line one right there. So I know it's very small, but that's kind of where it goes. So W-2 income goes there. If you're self-employed, it doesn't go here unless your small business gives you a paycheck. Moving down the line, uh, or sorry, so a W-2, what does that look like? Most of you probably have seen a W-2, but if you haven't, here's a picture of a W-2. Notice that it's got employee social security number here. The employer's Social Security number, we call it EIN, Employer Identification Number, that goes there. The employer will put their information right here. Uh, control number is just an internal thing. You don't need to have anything there. The employee's first and last name and address will be there. And then their wages, Social Security wages, Medicare wages. This is the tax withheld. So two is an important, that's how much was withheld from your paycheck. And that's what goes on the tax return as how much you've paid in advance. Then we've got your social security amount and then your Medicare. We'll talk more about these other boxes as well, but you've got some other information boxes, retirement and statutory employee. And then if you're in a state that has state income taxes, that information will be reported in lines box 15 right down here. Okay, so that's kind of what a W-2 looks and that's kind of a, a walkthrough of a W-2. Now we get into line two. Line two is taxable interest. This is interest received by or credited to the taxpayer in consideration for income and is taxable unless otherwise exempt. So if it's exempt, it goes into 2A. If it's not exempt, it's 2B. So exempt would be like municipal bonds. If you buy a municipal bond and that governmental agency pays you interest for borrowing your money, that interest comes to you tax-free. So you're not paying any taxes on it, but Congress wants you to report it. So you report it on 2A. Your bank is a corporation. It's not a governmental agency. And so when they pay you interest, you're gonna have to pay taxes on that. That number goes on 2B. Generally speaking, this can be found on form 1099 INT. And we've got a copy for that you right here. So here is a 1099 INT that you would receive from the bank. And then you would transfer these numbers onto the face of the second page of the 1040. So again, uh, the payers, this is the bank's information, not yours. A lot of people think that should be yours. That's the payers. The payers, taxpayer identification number, and then your number here, and then your information here. And then the amount of ta interest that you receive goes right here. Uh, you might have non-taxable tax-exempt interest that would go down here in line eight, or box eight, sorry. And then some other information, but generally speaking, most taxpayers is going to have everything filled out um, in circles, uh, except for this eight here. This is usually not, but that's basically everything in circles, usually what you're going to get on a 1099 MIS C. So, uh, this 10, sorry, 1099 INT. So the 1099 INT doesn't have to look like this. A bank can use an alternative 1099 INT. Typically they have the same information here. It's just in a different format to make it easier for them. Uh, and that's acceptable as well. So it doesn't need to look exactly like this, um, but most do. All right, so moving on to lines three, four, and five. So 
three, four, and five. These are other incomes that you might have. Line three refers to dividends. If you uh, are buying stocks and securities, you might receive a dividend. That goes in line three. Retirement plan taxability. So if you have a retirement plan like a traditional IRA, that might be taxable. That goes into line four. And then line five would be social security benefits. If you have social security benefits, but then you also make money, some of your social security benefits are taxable. That would go on line 5A and 5B. Moving on, we've got total income from schedule one, line six. So line six right here, we've got our first schedule, this is a new schedule that the IRS had to put out because they were reducing the tax form. On the schedule, we have in other in for income that might occur, and then you would add all those up and they would be transferred to here on the 1040 line six. So here's an example, here is a copy of that schedule one 1040. Notice it has some reserve uh, lines. Congress likes to do that, or sorry, the IRS likes to do that. Instead of like creating a new form, if there was something that used to be there, they like to put reserve and then leave that blank. And then when Congress makes additional changes, then they can just plug that new change right into there without having to redo a form. So you'll, um, you'll see a lot of reserves right now because of the changes in the tax law. But you know, alimony, taxable refund, business income, gains and losses, uh, rental, real estate, farm income, unemployment compensation. So if you have any of those, those would go on here and then you would total those and those would roll back to the 1040. So again, uh, one specific thing that we wanna point out here is line 19. Line 19 here is for unemployment compensation. So if you become unemployed, not through any fault of your own, and your state government gives you unemployment compensation insurance payments, that is taxable. A lot of people go, well, if the government's paying me, why are they taxing me on that money that they're paying me? It's because it's supposed to act like a replacement to income, and because income is taxable, this unemployment compensation is also taxable as well. So generally speaking, that information is going to be reported on form 1099G. So 1099G looks a little bit like this here. We've got the payer, this would be the government's information, their identification number, your identification number, and then your information right here. And then generally speaking, box one is the unemployment compensation amount that you will then roll to schedule one, and then that gets rolled to the 1040. Uh, box two, if you receive a refund from the government because of taxes in another year, that would go into line two. And then you got some other things here on the 1099G. Specifically for you, uh, that would be box one, unemployment compensation that would roll to schedule one and then to the 1040. So looking at line eight, we'll talk more about this later, but standard deduction. So the government says that you are given this allowance that is not taxable. That allowance right there is called standard deduction. We're gonna learn that you can either take standard deduction or itemize whichever is bigger. Most taxpayers are gonna be taking standard deduction. And so in this case right here, we have a box here that tells you what standard deduction is. If you are single or married filing separately, it's $12,000 in this case, 24 for married filing jointly or qualifying widower, head of household 18,000, and then um, if you checked any boxes under standard deduction, see the instructions and there's instructions that you can go back to there. So um, that's basically what you're gonna transfer to line eight. Um, unless your itemized deductions are greater, then you're gonna put that number in the box instead of the numbers here on the side. All right, line 10, taxable income. This represents your tax base, which is used to determine your preliminary tax liability. So once we've done all of those adjustments, then this is the amount that we're going to tax you on. And so we're gonna apply the tax rate to this tax base on line 10 here. If we go to 11, that gives us our preliminary tax uh, amount. So line 11 gives you how much you are owing to the federal government. And again, if you remember from our simple income tax calculation, then we're gonna make some adjustments here for prepayments as well as credits. In lines 12 through 18, that's where we make those adjustments for um, income tax that was withheld on your paycheck as well as your 
credits that you might be receiving from the federal government. So that goes into lines 12 to 18. I call that the reconciliation of your tax liability so that we can get to line 19 through 21, which is your refund. So if your tax liability is below all the payments you've made, then you're gonna get a refund. However, if all of your payments that you made were less than your tax liability, then you're gonna have some amount due and that goes on 22 and 23. So key thing here is if you have a number on 1920 um, A, and 21, uh, you should not be using lines 22 and 23. If you have amounts on 22 and 23, you should have not a refund. So you either get a refund or you owe, and so those are the sections that you're going to use there. Okay, so that's a basic walkthrough of the 1040. I know there was a lot, but as you can see, we pretty much have the front page which gives you your personal identifiable information, and then we start summarizing our income and our tax on the back page to get to how much we are owed as a refund or how much we will owe because we underpaid the federal government during the tax year. So I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough of a 1040. I promise you'll see it more often, um, but wanted to give you an understanding of what you're looking at when you first look at a 1040. So we'll see you in the next video.